Dr. Niall Gagan, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Well, thank you, David. It's a, an honor to be here. I've heard of this show for years, listened to your podcasts, and uh, so it's a great opportunity to be on the on the show. Well, I'm honored to, uh, to hear that. Um, you are a practitioner of coherence therapy, uh, uh, an approach that I've been interested in for some time, having uh, interviewed uh, Bruce Ecker, I think twice, some years ago, and I just, I thought, wow, this is, this is a very promising approach, and I guess it, I recently had the opportunity to hear you on a podcast out of Australia with two uh, digital friends of mine, uh, uh, Matthew Dalitz and Richard Hill, and I was so intrigued by, by that discussion that I just said, you know, I've got to get this guy on my show. Plus, I knew of you rather indirectly. Uh, you have a client who's a colleague of mine. I don't know if it's a current relationship. I don't see this person all that often, but I know that uh, he was seeing you for a while and making uh, very excited about the progress that he was making. So, uh, so there are two endorsements. And then you've got this um, four-part uh, teaching series on YouTube which I watched in preparation for our discussion today. And I came away uh, impressed by what an incredible teacher you are. Oh. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I, do, I, do, yeah. I do feel like it's a particular, it's, it, of course, we all gain skills at the types of therapy that we do. And it's a particular skill that I, I do try to hone of how do I explain this to other people and how do I put it in clear language that's not yeah. with too much jargon. Of course, we have to use some jargon, but that's not, you know, where we could, how do I break these ideas down into ways that everyone can understand? Yeah, well, you really succeeded in doing that. And also, uh, I just think it's very generous of you to make this, this precious knowledge freely available to people, you know, without having to sign up for a course, it may get them into a course, but it sure gives them a, a great introduction. So uh, I will, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So anybody who's listening or watching right now will uh, know how to find them. And, I, and that, I, that particular series uh, was exciting for me because the funny thing was it was actually not intended to be viewed by thousands of people. <laughs> I, I just created that um, about five years ago because I was going to be leading a workshop in Australia and I wanted the people who were attending the workshop to know the basics already. So we could jump into a more intermediate level of oh, yeah. how to actually do the practice. So I only intended about 30, uh, I think 35 people to watch that. But once it was on YouTube, it picked up a life of its own. And I, I'm not surprised. Thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of people have watched it, which oh, has been yeah. really Exciting. Wow. <laughs> it also made me realize what a great platform YouTube was for teaching. I, I don't think I had quite realized how much interest was out there until that video started. Getting yeah, it's fantastic. Involved. You know, I was reflecting about it and remembering that uh, I was a graduate student a long time ago. And uh, at that time, and, and the program that I was in was very psychoanalytic. And uh, I kind of I had a lot of resistance to that. So I was exploring the other approaches that were coming up around that time. It was mid 60s and when a lot of uh, alternative th therapies began to surface. And um, I still have respect for what I learned in, you know, about the psychoanalytic understanding of personality mainly. But in terms of therapeutic practice, I never really got the kind of hands-on supervision that's available today, mm -hmm. not just in not just in coherence therapy, but many other approaches too, where they've really kind of broken it down stepwise, kind of uh, the expression manualized it. And um, so I feel a little cheated <laughs> coming along so late uh, because I think I think that would have been wonderful. So uh, I congratulate you on on being part of that. Um, and so, how did you first learn about coherence therapy? So funny enough, uh, my, I got into it similarly. It sounds like to you. I also went to a psychoanalytic 
school. I went to the Wright Institute, which is here in Berkeley, which I am still deeply grateful to for the, the fundamentals that I learned about yeah. human beings and how people are structured. But I did spend most of my years of grad school frustrated, uh, feeling like there must be something more, there must be something quicker, more effective. I, I kept feeling like I was not being introduced to something. And, and I was being introduced to some CBT, but that also didn't feel quite right for me. Yeah. And, and the catchphrase that was repeated often by my professors in grad school was, um, you know, that all these studies have been done about what makes psychotherapy more effective, but the only thing that truly makes it more effective is longer psychotherapy. The more years that you work with somebody, uh -huh. the more effective it is. And while I'm sure that is true, I, I just was, I found that lacking for me. It, it just felt like something was still missing. So at that same time, uh, my wife, who is now an MFT, was in uh, the program at JFK University. And okay. um, Bruce Ecker was teaching the brief therapy class. Uh -huh. And she got all excited about it. It was called depth oriented brief therapy at that time before okay. he changed the name to coherence oh. therapy. And at that time, I was sort of like, well, I know everything. I don't need it. <laughs> One day I started reading the book with her and got hooked. I, as I just started glancing over her shoulder, reading the book she was reading, I, I said, that's the thing I've been yeah. looking for. That's wow. the, and I I've been hooked ever since I started training with Bruce. And uh, So did, did you go right into training or were you, uh, were you a client? Did you have any period of being a client first? I audited his class first. I went to JFK and audited his class. Okay. Uh, and then a group of us used to do a supervision group with him. So we would do, he would coach us th through doing live sessions with each other. Yeah. So I was both client and therapist in those coached sessions. Um, and I did briefly, I did a few sessions with Bruce, uh, with him as my therapist, um, but really only a few. We didn't go deep into that. Uh, but I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultation with him where he would help, help me work with my clients. So I worked with him in a number of different um, contexts. What was it that initially hooked you? You say your wife was, you had this book and all. What was the, the core piece that spoke to you? I remember it crystal clear. We were actually on, on an airplane. So I, that's why I was reading the book over, <laughs> over her shoulder. She was sitting next to me and I looked down and it was the piece, you know, now I said earlier, I like to not use too much lingo, uh, but there is a really important piece of lingo in coherence therapy, which is uh, an idea that Bruce introduced me to that I had never heard before, which was this concept of the anti-symptom position and the pro-symptom position. You, I'm sure, have heard of this before from having... Well, as taking your video course, I've heard of it. <laughs> taking my video course, right. Yeah. <laughs> so the anti-symptom position means, you know, people come into therapy saying, I've got this symptom. I don't like it. I don't want it. How do I get rid of it? I don't like that I'm depressed. I don't like that I procrastinate. I don't like that I, you know, can't stop yelling at my kid, whatever it is. That's their symptom. And they come in in an anti-symptom position. Their conscious position is the symptom is bad. I don't like it. It makes no sense. Right. So the anti-symptom position is, 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 is against the symptom and it's the conscious symptom or, or position they come into therapy with. And what he was saying is if we look and if we search the right ways and if we use the right experiential techniques to access different parts of the client's psyche, we will discover time and time again that there's a part of the client, just a part that is, is actively creating this symptom and maintaining this symptom for some really powerful, really compelling yeah. unconscious reason. Right? Yeah. So if I'm yelling at my kid, even though I don't like it and it's getting me in trouble, there may be some part of me that says, you know, I was never listened to. I was never heard. This is the only way to get heard is to raise my voice. That's what I had to do with my dad. And now I'm doing it again. Right. For example. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we don't want to get there in a cognitive heady sort of cognitive minds to cognitive mind heady way. We want to set up experiential circumstances that will let the person suddenly almost be surprised to bump yeah. into it. 
This is and this that is, whole concept yeah. was new to me and was super exciting to me when I first heard it. Yeah, uh, the, the psychoanalytic term comes to mind of ego dystonic, which I think is saying the same thing. It feels uh, foreign to me that I have this symptom, not really me. I'm. It's a, something from the outside that's afflicting me. So I definitely rec recognized and got the feel of that, you know, although it was, it was a new way of languaging it. And the other thing is, it strikes me that, you know, it's got something in common with other approaches to uh, short-term therapy of instead of resisting the presenting system, it's almost like a kind of jujitsu or yes. uh, some kind of martial art move, you know, of, okay, I'm going to take it. I'm not going to argue you out of it. Um, I'm not going to give you facile su suggestions. Uh, I'm going to take it as, as you're giving it to me. And, but we're going to move, <laughs> we're going to move with this. Oh, so I think and, it's and not only are we going to move with it, oftentimes I want to amplify it. If I hear a little bit of something that sounds like, oh, that sounds like a part that might, a part of the client that might feel empowered by the thing that they say they don't want, right? Yeah. I'll say, ooh, tell me, I want to hear more from that part. Let's have you say that out loud, right? Yeah. Let's have you move in that way. That's where we get into this whole range yeah. of experiential techniques that actually amplify it so so at a certain point in the session you have the person almost proudly trumpeting <laughs> the reason <laughs> why they should keep doing this thing yeah. and they're surprised to hear themselves saying it they'll often say I, I can't believe i'm saying this but it feels so true for a part of me yeah uh let me have you take a step back and uh talk about memory reconsolidation a bit which uh you let me, in the other interview that I heard you do uh, with the guys in Australia, you made the point, hey, I'm not an expert on the theoretical uh, biological underpinnings of this approach, which is called memory reconsolidation. And um, that's the piece that excited me when I first heard about it. Uh, I, I don't know that all of this whole therapy had been developed at that point or not. Um, it seems to me that it's highly developed now, and I think there must have been an evolution, you know, yeah. over, over these years. Um, so memory reconsolidation really points to something at the cellular level. Uh, you, you say it. <laughs> you can probably do it better than me. So memory reconsolidation was not a concept that I had ever heard of when I first started doing coherence therapy. Bruce Ecker was the person who got it on my radar screen. And I thought, I think he got it on many, many of our radar screens. Yeah. Wrote this book uh, uh, with a number of other colleagues uh, called Unlocking the Emotional Brain, which I believe you interviewed him about. And, and that was because he was doing a lot of neuropsych research on his own and was seeing and hearing things in the field of neuropsych that made sense to him for the first time of why coherence therapy and a whole range of similar experiential therapies are so effective. He was hearing, he was starting to see things in the, in the neuropsych research that started to make sense to him of, of what's happening in these moments, these profound moments of transformation. Yeah. By the way, it can happen in any, I mean, psychodynamic therapy can have these moments, but, it just seems that a, a certain number of experiential therapies seem to make these moments happen more frequently and more consistently. Yeah, yeah. Others, right? So, so the idea is that uh, the old, the old um, sort of conceptualization of psychotherapy was that the person comes in with certain neural networks, neural networks that are well established. And we can't really do anything about those because that's just their, that's their learnings and that's their knowings. But maybe we can teach them something new through interpretation or through corrective emotional experiences or whatever it might be. And hopefully we can override the old knowings and the old meanings and the old networks with new ones. And just through repetition, eventually we can overpower the old one with the new one. So the old one will always be there, but the new one can sort of, Mm, override it or overrun it, right? Yeah. 
what to, he's to, to, to me, in a, in a way, this is like the, dis, the rediscovery, if you will, of the unconscious. In other words, there is a, a you know, in, in your teaching videos, you talk about knowings and, and yeah. un unconscious knowings. So it's not quite the Freudian version, although Freud thought that it ultimately it would get to the place that science would get to the place where the, uh, there would be a biological understanding of what was going on. Yeah. So this memory co consolidation poses the idea, and I guess it can be demonstrated at the cellular level at least, that uh, a memory can can be uh, disappeared, if you will, can be made to disappear and and be overwritten by a new experience. And that there's a critical period at the cellular yeah. level, a, crit a critical period of about two hours, you said, where if, if there's an opening, you know, you know, that something new can replace it. That is the concept, right? Rather than just assuming that the old networks are there and there's nothing we can do about it, what, what it's saying is that there are moments where, if the right conditions occur, that a, a new piece of incompatible data can come into the person's awareness. We call it a mismatch experience. They have a schema that's been very, we, make, we bring the schema to consciousness, we get them fully in their schema, and then we bring them in, in, into contact with something that just doesn't fit the schema. And when that happens, that it literally on a neurobiological level can unlock the synapses for a t for that's that two hour window some people call it a four or five hour window I, I think there's some debate about how long that window is but where those those synapses because basically because the person is so surprised in that moment to realize oh something doesn't fit my global schema that the synapses loosen and in that moment there's a potential to rewire the synapses and have them re by the time everything solidifies again, that people yeah. will say something felt true to me for the first 45 years of my life and has never really felt true ever since that experience. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's memory reconsolidation in a nutshell. That's the subjective experience. Yeah, and it uh, come, comes to mind because of the short-term therapy uh, that you mentioned earlier is the work of Eric Erickson. Not, yeah. not Eric, Eric, Milton Erickson. Milton Erickson. Milton yeah. Erickson, who had his own uh, uh, judo <laughs> style of disrupting people's patterns, right? It would just Absolutely. do things that were so out of context, out of so surprising, coming out of left field, that would yeah. kind of jolt them. Absolutely. So I, it seems like there could be a connection there. Oh, I believe there's absolutely a connection yeah. and there's a whole range of experiential therapies that I believe manage to set up uh, these similar, each in their own way, some through an element of confusion and surprise, some through a more sort of steady, progressive, just uh, uh, course of mindfulness and attention but that each get eventually get the person into a state where their core beliefs are really isolated and are front and center and then can be challenged yeah. in one of the moments. What are, and, one of the core and, idea one of the core ideas, excuse me for interrupting. Oh, no, <laughs> I can easily just fall into not being interactive at all. And I, I and then I beat myself up for not being interactive. So I'm being interactive. Um, one of the, one of the, one of the points that you, that you really hammer home that uh, that's very meaningful to me is it's got to be experiential. This yeah. is an experiential approach at its core. And you want to get away from a lot of talking, a lot of uh, explanation, a lot of trying to teach the person one thing or another or persuade them of, of something different. You want them to have an experience and one of discovery. And there's a particular reason for that. So when you said earlier that in memory reconsolidation, a memory can be erased 
we're not talking about conscious memories, right? Like, right. you know, I went to a movie three years ago. No one's going to erase the memory of the fact that I went to that movie. Or if I was in a bad car accident, no one's going to erase the memory of the fact this is not eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, yeah, right? Yeah. Where you can literally erase, you know, historical memories. What we're talking about here is implicit memories or implicit knowings, which are usually these global senses about myself or the world, right? The world yeah. is a safe place. I am a bad person. These very deep core yeah. global knowings about oh, yeah. men are not safe, right? Yeah. Well, Women and these, be trusted. these these things that we pick up in our from our early life experiences. And that, so they're, they're emotional memories, really. They are, emotional. And they're all held in the emotional brain. That's what I was yeah, going to say. And, and you, you, uh, in your course, you uh, say, you know, they're not conscious. They're in the limbic brain, which is uh, separate, doesn't have the uh, higher, the uh, forebrain doesn't have access to that. It has limited access. <laughs> limited access. Right? Everything's connected. Everything's connected. Brain. And so we, I, I believe that even a, a very, you know, talk, classic talk therapy will eventually activate knowings in the limbic mm. brain. The question yeah. is, can we speed that process up? Can we shorten, can we make it more effective? And yeah. I just have found that there's nothing more effective than when I talk about experiential exercises, I have people do a lot of things where I have them maybe close their eyes, you know, and visualize the important figure. Like I want you to picture your mother, right? And say out loud to her so that I can hear it, that you're talking to her. Yeah. Tell her what you just told me, right? right? right. Like that's one thing to do. Another would be to have the person stand up and move in a certain way or hold their body in a certain way. Or yeah. there are all sorts of things. Or we could use art therapy. We could use writing. There are all sorts of different techniques. But yeah. Anything that gets the person out of the prefrontal cortex to prefrontal cortex, verbal, cognitive yeah. mind is going to just access the implicit knowings in the limbic brain much more quickly. Yeah, this is really what excites me and draws me to this approach is uh, uh, I've for a long time been on the experiential train and tried to, to uh, make my courses experiential uh, for the 30 or so years that I taught to always have some kind of experiential component because I so strongly believe in that mm -hmm. yeah. and was drawn to the experiential approaches that grew out of the 60s, things like gestalt therapy and the short-term uh, short therapy approaches and family therapy approaches and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, psychodrama, you were talking about getting people sure. to act out. So there's just sure. a, a host of things and that's what... And you've actually got a website that you've created called yeah. Experiential Therapies. Experiential-psychotherapies.com is the uh, yes. full name of the site. But yes, the what what you know, I got originally very excited about coherence therapy, and it still is the primary thing that I practice. But over the years, I started finding trainings in all sorts of similar forms of therapy the Hakomi and internal family systems and AEDP and EMDR, all, many of which have big names for themselves in their own right and have, have developed very large followings globally. Yeah. And I started really realizing that, that so many of these therapies are fierce, much more in common than they differ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one of the exciting things. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if you know John Arden, who's written about the brain. And Oh, and I absolutely do. John Arden was my, uh, he brought me into, I, I spent eight years at Kaiser Permanente, and John was the ah. person who brought me in as a postdoc intern well, uh, originally, so I know John. Yeah, was. now he's left Kaiser, and he's living in uh, in New Mexico, and so uh, we used to have lunch together often, and we had a mutual hobby horse of, of sensing that the schools, as we knew them, the schools of therapy were dissolving and that there was some kind of an emerging understanding, an emerging approach that the therapies were not as different uh -huh. 
as they used to be. And there used to be so much staked around an individual personality and so on. Yeah. So that's, that's a vision that we both shared. So that gets me very well, excited. That is, that is absolutely my vision. Um, I, the big, a big part of the push for me to create the website that you're referring to is that I, I didn't see that happening fast enough for my taste. What I saw was um, that for good reason, I don't think it's just because of big personalities, but many of these therapies, you can learn them fairly easily, but then to really master what you're doing and to know that you can do it really effectively with your clients, people need to delve deep. And once they delve deep, they tend, in my experience, to then lose sight of the other experiential psychotherapies that are could also be very interesting and informing to them and sort of get, I just do this. Uh, you know, I'm, of course- Yeah, they get excited because they, they do something that they see works. That they see works, right. Yeah, and, and that, of course, would be very exciting to any therapist because Which you want to do what works. Which I'm so happy for them that they yeah. found that. And, and I think overall, they've become a much better therapist once they find some of these schools. And I was finding my, for myself that every time I watched a video or went to a training in one of these other therapies, I would instantly bring it back and make my own therapy. Even if I didn't take that school on wholesale, yeah. I, it would make my coherence therapy work more effective. And that I just wanted more people to have that experience. So that's part of why I've created this website. So if people come in looking for their school, there will be a lot of things directing them to say, hey, check out this. Yeah, thing. yeah. It's, well, it's that technique that you can integrate into what you're already doing. And it's a great website. And not only does it list a whole bunch of uh, of therapeutic approaches, I didn't count them. I was tempted to count them. I've got the list here. I could read it, but I won't. I won't take up our time doing that. There's about, a dozen, there's about a dozen at this point with more, more to come. Okay. Yeah. More to come. But you also have a list of techniques pulled from these various approaches. And to me, that's a very promising direction for the future to, uh, so instead of having a, a huge allegiance to a particular school of therapy, rather the therapist has a quiver of arrows, so to speak, that he can he or she can use, and uh, and and you know you can't help but think about the old story about the the blind people who are trying to describe the elephant, and it depends upon which part of the elephant uh, they're patting down, and that really seems to be where we've been, and the uh, you're bringing the blind men together. <laughs> I I, was, I hope that that's the case. That is definitely part of my intention. Part of my intention is to break down some of the boundaries between the experiential schools that already exist. And the other, the other half of the intention is that it seems to me still that the vast majority of psychotherapists globally don't work experientially and don't even really know that experiential work is an option that's available to them. I talk yeah. to a lot of psychologists, a lot of therapists who, when, when I describe exper working experientially, it's as if I'm introducing them to a concept that they've just never even heard of before. And so I wanted to, what, what I ultimately want to do is bring with the website is to bring many people who have not previously even considered working experientially, or, or maybe who have thought about it, but thought, oh, I don't know how to get started with that into the experiential world. And yeah, I'm trying to think, how did I get experiential? One is I wanted to, I wanted to be a, a, a writer, a novelist, a short story. And I wanted to have a life worthy of being a hero. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so I, I kind of imagined myself being in a film or something and made sure that I was having adventures. So for, for very early on, I had uh, an attraction to subjective experience mm -hmm. and thought that, you know, that's the thing. That's, that was the thing I was interested in. So later when I was in graduate school, I encountered encounter groups, uh -huh. which were and that was the thing that really turned me on because it was being in a small group 
and staying there, <laughs> exchanging feedback until you had some experiences. I mean, you really would have some powerful experiences, which I did. Very powerful, right? Yeah, and so that uh, has affected my whole career uh, from in then part because on. in the encounter groups, you didn't have somebody interpreting what was happening right. and bringing everyone back up into their head constantly, yeah. right? At, yeah. if, at most, my experience of encounter groups has been at most you had somebody just reflecting what was happening, but not saying why or making sense yeah. of it or making everyone think about it. And so things get, as you I'm sure know well, people's limbic systems get very activated in those encounter, in those encounter groups. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe we, maybe I should ask you to take us through the uh, the major stages. Because uh, we're talking about it like everybody knows what we're talking about. We've kind of jumped into the deep end of the pool. And uh, so, yeah, g give us the, the overview. It's three stages. Talk about the three major stages and okay. some of the substages. And sure, sure. Absolutely. So the three stages of coherence therapy, the first one is called uh, discovery. And in the discovery phase, that's where, like I described, the client comes into therapy, says, I have this symptom, I hate it, I've been trying all these things to get rid of it, I can't figure out why, I can't seem to shake it. And, and the, in the, the discovery phase, the therapist makes it his or her sole and only goal is to set up the experiential circumstances that will help start to elucidate or illuminate, let's say, to both the therapist and the client, what makes sense of this? It's a real, it's a sense-making um, process. And it's not the therapist using his or her mind and saying, oh, I bet it's this and I'm going to suggest it. It's yeah. just, let's just set up techniques. And this therapist is more often surprised than, than not, right? Yeah. It's, I can often have, think, oh, I bet it's going to be I bet we're going to find this is the reason, but far more often I'm going to be surprised. It's probably hard to, I, I would think initially it would be hard to resist that. It is very hard to resist that, especially if we've been trained to be interpretive. Yeah, right. With all it's the exposure hard. that I had to psychoanalytic thought, Two things I, think, are hard. I always think I know what's going on. Two things are hard. One is to set aside our expert mind and yeah. really approach every client from a place of beginner's mind. Yeah. That's difficult for Very sure. The other thing that's the other thing that's equally challenging is that tendency to want to, as you described earlier, uh, counteract the symptom, which might mean to give suggestions. Well, have you tried this? Well, why don't you do that? Well, what if you do, maybe you need to take a time out so then you don't yell, right? Or, what are many most therapists find it equally difficult to not want to push back and counteract? Yeah, I, in your workshops, just to divert a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, in your workshops, do you find that the people are coming? Are they mostly newbies? Are they mostly therapists who are interested in changing horses? Um, Oftentimes, the people who come to me, whether it's workshops or people who contact me and just want to work with me individually, um, will say, I've, I've read the books, I've read maybe the practice manual, I've watched some videos, I'm just lit about these ideas, but, but because of the two things we just said, they're often stuck. They're saying, but I'm having a hard time actually doing this with my clients. Yeah. yeah. That's when they'll often reach out and want to do workshops, whether it's with the Coherence Psychology Institute or... Yeah, I, I can see that the workshops uh, and probably one-on-one -on -one supervision as well would be just so important because otherwise you can have an understanding yeah. of what you're talking about, a conceptual understanding. But I just know that without that kind of intense supervision, I would fall into... Because feeling like I know it and saying both of those things are so counterintuitive for most of us that yeah. that desire to interpret and the desire to counteract something yeah. that seems so bad are it that it, that those are the two things that I think make the learning curve be a steep one for yes. people and what and why it's helpful for people to reach out. 
for a little more support. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I in interrupted now, your flow. Well, we quickly bumped into the third thing that people <laughs> okay, thought okay. that's tricky, which is then it's also not intuitive for people. How do I, It's it can be the most fun part of working with people, but also in some ways the most challenging, which is how do I create, how do I do this experientially? How do I set up an experience even though I have a sense of what might be happening here, how do I set up an experience for the person? That's That doesn't come naturally to a lot of people necessarily either. Yeah. Some people more than others, but it helps to get some guidance on what's the stance of working experientially? How do you slow things down? How do you get people out of their cognitive mind? Especially some clients really wanna keep going back up into their head. How do you not, go back up into the head and get caught there with them and bring them back to the moment, to the here and now, to, uh, 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 to a stance of mindfulness. Another diversion. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I've gotten re-interested in psychedelics, not taking any myself, mm -hmm. but there's a, a renaissance of uh, the potential of psychedelics right. to facilitate therapy and as a kind of fast track to yep. get people into a very experiential mode. Do you have any going any, on in Michael Pollan's book? It's a it's a yeah. huge field right now, right? Yeah. So, any thoughts about that? I have clients ask me about this all the time, um, and consultees sometimes as well. I'm, I'm hesitant. I'm not saying no, it's a bad idea for sure. But I personally believe that I can, and that not just me, that one can get clients in a very specific and targeted way to exactly the material they need to get in touch with through experiential techniques more effectively than by putting them on a substance that's going to fairly globally affect their psyche for a period of time. And that, well, we'll get to this in a moment, but I was gonna say this, there's three stages of coherence therapy. There's discovery, there's integration, and then there's transformation. The, that integration phase is where in discovery, we're really getting people into their limbic brain and helping them get in touch with emotionally held truths. In integration, we're helping reconnect their cognitive mind to that. And yeah. oftentimes between sessions, I, you know, at the end of every session, I give people an index card to read right. that all it says on it is the thing that felt true for them during the session, because I want them to read it every day and notice the part of them that quote unquote knows this to be true as they go through their daily life experiences, right? as they go through their interpersonal uh, in interactions. And that whole process, I, I believe that whole process is gonna be tricky. We, we can go deep into discovery with psychedelics. The integration is often trickier. Yeah, and people who are who are doing the psychedelic therapy actually talk a lot about integration. Yeah. And that's, that's they recognize that that's a big issue. And uh, I find your answer totally satisfactory. So yeah. just, just one last thing I'll say about that. I mean, again, I don't want to be, I, I'm not, I haven't put enough energy into going deep into the research of what's right. all right. the details of what's happening with psychedelics. So I, I don't want to be the guy saying, no, absolutely not. But certainly when people just go and do a, a lot of shamanic journeying or ayahuasca or all the various things that are going on a lot around Northern California, I see people having profound, amazing realizations. It's questionable to me if how much of that gets integrated and sticks yeah. with people over time. Now, I, you know, I know that what you're referring to is maybe a little more targeted than that, but that's, that's just the challenge in it. And, and I, and hopefully people will keep making progress on how to, yeah. You know, one, one of the therapies that uh, in your list of, of therapies is family systems therapy. And that's one that's being integrated quite a bit into the psychedelic context. Yeah. But we don't have to keep going there. Let's yeah. get back on coherence. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So 
So picking back up, we've got discovery where we create experiential techniques that help the, usually the therapist starts really becoming aware, oh, that's what makes sense of this symptom for part of this client. Then we want to help the client integrate that into their awareness. So, so because they're usually just in the experiences and they're saying things and they're saying things that feel true. But then we want to have them have a moment of mindfulness where they're able to step out and, and have their own internal observer recognize what it is that they just said. Yeah. And m- most of my sessions actually just involve those two stages. We'll yeah. discover something and then we spend the last 20 minutes or so making sure that they really see it and they'll be looking at me going, oh, wow, that's, wow, that's why I've been doing that. They have a kind of, a kind of aha. That, but now I really, it's, yeah. That's the aha moment for them. Yeah. And at first when they're, at first when they're in the experience, I'm having the aha moment for myself, yeah. but in, in integration, they start having the aha moment uh-huh. and then we want to capture it on an index card or if I'm working with someone remotely, I send them a, a, an email, right? And, and I'll usually just ha- say, listen, between now and when we talk next week or in two weeks or whenever it's going to be, I want you just to read this once a day, maybe a couple times a day. Just read it and just notice at what moments this feels true. Notice at what moments this kicks in. Do you find that in this time of uh, social isolation and COVID that you're that working remotely, that you're able to get the same results? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I was working probably 60% remotely even before COVID. Uh, so it wasn't a huge leap for me, but I don't find... Um, I don't find that anything gets lost. Uh, Fascinating. If I'm working with somebody on Zoom, even with certain clients I've, I mainly work with or have only worked with on over the phone or with Zoom with no, some people for one reason or another don't want the video. And, you know, I just close my eyes a lot more and yeah. listen and intuit for, just listen intuitively for non non visual cues. Yeah. And pick up on all sorts of things that, I'm remembering one of the things that you were dissatisfied with about uh, your your training at the Wright Institute was it was too slow. It, do you see the do you see uh, coherence therapy as a short term approach? I yeah, I absolutely do. The caveat to that being that our definition of short term has shifted over the years. It's gotten a little longer than you, than you right. thought. Right, as, as our, our, our expectation of everything being short-term, right, has become, yeah. you know, if my phone hesitates for two and a half seconds to download my email, I now feel like, yeah, what's going on here? Why isn't my phone You, you like, do a job around the house that you think is going to take about 10 minutes, two hours later. <laughs> right, right. Our, our perceptions of time can be kind of funky. But yeah. when I was in grad school 20 years ago, you know, it was, I think people were incredulous about the idea that you could bring about significant results in, in psychotherapy in 10 to 12 sessions. That was a fairly new idea at that point. Nowadays, there's almost an expectation that people will bring about profound change in one session or two sessions. And, and so I hesitate when people contact me and they say, I've read the book and I want to try this. And I feel like this is the right therapy for me. I, I want to make sure that people aren't expecting that we are going to get in there and zap some super deep core implicit knowing and, and wrap it all up in, in an hour, because that it's not that I don't believe that anything is that short term, but yes, you, know, you have a, a sense of the average number of sessions. 10 or 12 sessions would be plenty for to for, even for some fairly significant uh, presenting symptoms. It, that would be plenty to bring about some profound change. Now, having said that, I have plenty of clients who I've worked with for much longer, but oftentimes it's because they came in wanting to work on one particular thing after a certain number of sessions, that thing was no longer an issue, but then yeah. they realized, oh, well, now I want to work on this new thing, and now I want to work on this. So we'll do a whole series, in a way, of short Yeah, I was wondering about that, because uh, it's like you you pull at the thread, you know. They come in, you figure out what that thread is, you pull at it, you know, until you get some kind of resolution. And, and it occurred to me, well, some people might have a whole lot of threads that keep coming to mind. 
some people have more things they only realize once they get into therapy that oh well i could go deeper and deeper yeah ultimately therapy can go to a very deep spiritual transpersonal place if we decide to follow if if, if that's what we feel moved to do so i have mm -hmm. clients who come in saying i want to work on one particular thing we work on it that symptom it no longer is problematic for them and then they say thank you very much and they leave yeah and other yeah. clients who we do in effect a, a long ongoing series of short-term yeah. therapy yeah fascinating but to me that's what makes it a short-term therapy is that we can we can really look for markers of demonstrable progress in every session are there uh any uh, uh people for whom this is not an appropriate approach diagnostic categories or however you want to conceptualize it well People who are, when people come in with trauma, I will always start out working with them in this way. However, if I start to create experiential exercises for somebody and it plunges them into their trauma to the point where they can't stay mindful and present, then I quickly shift and will move, temporarily move away from the coherence therapy model and do some straight up trauma work, whether that be uh -huh. EMDR or some similar kind of uh -huh, fascinating. trauma work. Now, once they get to the place where they are now able to stay, think about the traumatic things and stay mindful and present, then we may shift back and re and pick back up with our discovery work where we left off. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So I don't, I don't assume that just because trauma is involved, we can't do the work, but I'll look for the markers as we get started. Where do you see this work going? Coherence <laughs> therapy in particular? Yeah, yeah, coherence therapy. What I, what I hope is that as more and more people get introduced to this way of thinking, um, I, I think there's a potential for there to be a real um, breakthrough globally for, for the therapeutic community. If they start to understand that, wow, we don't need to spend 50 sessions of, you know, getting to know each other and picking up information and making interpretations and then dealing with all the resistance to those interpretations and then having some of them sink in and that long, slow process yeah. that we can, I often think of a wrinkle in time, which I read in middle school and I've never read, read since, unfortunately, but where they realize, well, time, you don't have to go linearly through space. So there's moments where the, the, mm. the two ends come and there's yeah. a wormhole and you can pop through that people can start to realize, wow, there's a, a, a very powerful sort of, accelerator that's possible here. Yeah. But I don't I don't want to make it sound like that's only coherence therapy. I, I think any of the dozen or so forms of experiential psych therapy that you'll find on my site, ha any of them have the potential to speed up and uh, and make therapy more more effective in a similar way. And some work for some people and others work for others. No, you yeah. know, not, not everybody is going to necessarily find that coherence therapy, even if it makes sense to them, is going to work best for their personality and mm -hmm. their way of doing things. Internal family systems or ISTDP or one of the others might work, might work better for, for somebody else. Is there anything that comes out of this work for you as you think about the pandemic that's going on right now mm -hmm. and people who are kind of isolated and suffering, is, are there any kind of uh, mental hygiene ideas mm -hmm. that flow out of this work that could benefit people, say, who are listening to us now and who are in distress? Maybe that could be kind of a wrap up for our discussion. Sure, sure. <clears throat> you know, some of the core um, pillars that I think coherence therapy stands on and also all these experiential therapies stand on are mindfulness, mm -hmm. presence, 
acceptance of what is not trying to push back against what is but acceptance uh-huh. of what is which doesn't mean that we just resign ourselves to what is but we accept this is what's happening let's like you said jujitsu let's go with the flow yeah. of what's happening right in Taoism, they would call that the Tao. let's go with the Tao and not resist the the way yes. that things are happening and you know the current times challenge us to do that in a way that many of us have not been challenged right or and and I think that's true for everybody, but I, I'm feeling that among my clients, I'm feeling that most powerfully for my clients who are in their 20s and 30s, especially single, young, single clients who, you know, this is the time where they, what they want to do emotionally, psychologically, biolog- biologically is be out and meeting potential partners and yeah. And, and, and finding their place in the world and engaging in activities while they have freedom and time. And they're all under house arrest. Yeah, and maybe that's why uh, some seemingly, some crowds, you know, have been uh, uh, so rebellious because that drive is under there of the socializing and move, moving ahead appropriately from that through that stage of life. I believe it is. And yeah. so I see some people who just rebel, which yeah. we could call that counteracting, right? And just yeah. say, screw it. I'm just going to go out. Unfortunately, some of them get sick. There's also, or get other people sick. I also see some people who just collapse and go into resignation and that can look like depression and anxiety yeah. and, yeah. and uh, demoralization. Right. And f- I think for, for that group, but of course for all of us, this time just calls on us all to whatever mindfulness practices we might have or have heard of or have considered taking on. This is a time more than ever to really turn towards what, what it is that are limit, the being limited or being scared or, or the uncertain world around us is activating in us, right? So that we can understand more why we're reacting in the ways we are. Yeah. Right? Well, Niall, so that's, that's what generates symptoms. That's what generates the, the behavioral symptoms. Yeah. If, if it's unconscious. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, being my guest today on shrink wrap radio and uh, been a, a joy for me stimulating. <laughs> thank you, David. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, I encourage people to please check out the, the new website. I'm sure you'll put links, but I, I hope that people will just find it as a resource, use it as a resource to breathe new life into their own work. Excellent. So, whatever they're, however they're working already. Yeah, yeah. Well, bless you in your work. I think you're doing great stuff and uh, hope to run into you again. <laughs>